Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa So this is our third installment on the series about early Buddhist history. In the last talk, I spoke about the First and Second Councils, which were very formative events in early Buddhism. And the First Council establishing the canon and the Second Council representing the first division or split in Buddhism. Um, the split between the Staviravada and the Mahasamgikas. And in the subsequent centuries, both of these uh, main schools tended to proliferate further. And even before the arising of Mahayana, there were traditionally said to be 18 separate schools of Buddhism in India. But this number is really a, an underestimate, we can find at least 25 or 30 names of schools. Now this whole area of uh, discussion is very uncertain and there's a lot of scholarly debate around the details. Nothing is, uh, or very little, is really known for certain about any of it. One of the problems is the paucity of our sources. Out of these original schools, the only one surviving today is the Theravada. And as we'll see in the subsequent talks, the, the history of the Theravada is not an un is not so simple as to say it's simply the original root stock. But we'll leave that aside for the moment. The only complete or close to complete canon we have for any of these schools are two, the Theravada and the Sarvastivada. We have only fragments of the other schools. And in many cases, we only know them from the words of their adversaries. Two of our main sources for the doctrines of the different schools are the Theravadan text Katawatu, which is the last book of the Abhidhamma, added at the time of the Third Council under King Asoka. And this uh, book is like a debate manual, bringing up the various points of doctrine that are raised by schools outside of Theravada and um, giving sample debates of how uh, a monk could refute these doctrines. A similar source from the Sarvastivada side is the Vibhasa, which is uh, in part has, part of the Vibhasa has a similar sort of theme to the Katawatu in that it deals with the doctrines of uh, schools differing from the Sarvastivada. So a lot of our information about all the rest of the schools comes from these two sources. So we only know about them from their adversaries, so to speak. Another issue is we have to understand what is meant in this context, in the context of Buddhist history by a school it's not exactly the same thing as in Christianity, say, where we talk about all the different denominations of Protestantism that are clearly defined separate communities. There's a lot of, in the, the Buddhist schools, they weren't always even adversaries to each other. Chinese pilgrims who traveled in India later would often report that there would be monasteries with monks mixed of different schools of thought holding in a common community but having separate teachings. Part of what's going on here is that 
there is a separate transmission of Dhamma and Vinaya. So although the only surviving school from these days is Theravada in both Dhamma and Vinaya, there still survives today the Vinaya of the Dharmaguptakas, which was taken up in China and East Asia generally, and the Vinaya of the Mulasarastavadans, which is practiced in Tibet. So even though they've, in both cases, they've developed Mahayana or Vajrayana doctrines and established different schools of, of doctrine, they're holding to the original Vinaya transmission out, out of India from these original schools. So with these basic caveats in mind and remembering that all of this material is rather uncertain and subject to controversy about details, uh, let's look at some of the major schools and divisions and how they arose. As we talked about in the last installment, the first split was between the Staviravada, and that is the, that name is simply the Sanskrit version of Theravada. It's the school of the elders, and the Mahasangika, which is the, the big group or the majority group. This is what the name means. And this uh, dates to the period of the Second Council. To uh, recapitulate, at the Second Council, it was decided to retain the original Vinaya, but many of the monks were not happy with this. And 37 years later, they held another council at Pataliputra. And at that time, the council broke up without coming to a conclusion and resulted in two separate communities of monks, the Staviravada and the Mahasamgikas. And the controversy at this council was not over Vinaya, but over the so-called five points of Mahadeva, which we talked about last time. Mahadeva had proposed uh, five propositions that amounted to a diminution of the status of an arahant, that an arahant was not a perfected being. He was subject to various flaws. He was subject to ignorance. He was subject to uh, having uh, nocturnal emissions and subject to falling away. All of this is contrary to the orthodox doctrine. So those monks who accepted Mahadeva's five points became the Mahasamgikas. And the uh, other monks who held to the original doctrine retained the name of Staviravada. And both of these schools subsequently split and fractured further. The Mahasamgikas are generally considered to be the ancestors or precursors of the Mahayana. And some of their doctrines that they developed definitely have a very Mahayana flavor. For example, reading from, I'm reading from the book, uh, The Buddhist Sex of the Lesser Vehicle by Andre Barot, 1955 about the Mahasangika doctrine, because the Buddha with his mind of benefited beings is never for surfeited, he does not enter into nirvana. His compassion, karuna, is limitless. His longevity is infinite. If there are beings to whom it is suitable that the Buddha should manifest his miracles and bliss of his quietude, he is born into royal, the royal palace, etc. He accomplishes the awakening bodhi. He converts and guides those beings. If there are beings to whom it is suitable to manifest the stopping of causality, he fictitiously, nirmana, enters into nirvana. Since his mind is not surfeited, 
he abides in the form of a body of enjoyment, Sambhogakaya, until the end of time. He creates Nimata, forms adapted to different kinds of beings and teaches by means of skillful means, Upaya. So they were turning the Buddha into a kind of godlike figure, that the Buddha is not a real flesh and blood human being, but he manifests a Nimata, a form on the earth, which they term Sambhogakaya, which is a, a precursor of the developed ideas in Mahayana Buddhism of the three bodies of the Buddha, Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya. So that concept arose quite early on amongst the uh, Mahasamgikas. So the Buddha was becoming, in their interpretation, the Buddha was becoming a... Uh, a kind of a celestial or divine being who only manifested in an illusory form on the earth to teach beings. So this is quite different from the traditional view and the Theravada view to this day that uh, Siddhartha Gautama was an actual flesh and blood human being who attained to supreme enlightenment. So this, of course, was a completely irreconcilable difference of opinion and the two schools went their separate ways. To talk about the Staviravada and further developments in the Staviravada first, they split again early on, and it's debatable which was the first major split, but it seems like it very likely was a split between the uh, root of the Staviravada and the breakaway group, the Sarvastavada. And... Some accounts date this to the Third Council of Ahsoka, which I'll talk about more in the next installment. But in brief, the Sarvastivada are actually pretty close doctrinally to the Theravada, but they have a number of different points. And the one that seems to have been the most controverted was the Sarvastivada doctrine of the three times. The name Sarvastivada means all exists. And they held a theory that past, present, and future all have an equal ontological status. They all exist. And it's only our perception or our consciousness that perceives the present moment. But the three times are actually all existent. This was denied by Staviravada, who held as the Theravada do to this day, that only the present moment is actually real. Past and the future are, uh, have either not come into being or have ceased to be. And a thought of the past, for example, a memory, is, is not a perception of any real thing, but just that, um, an image generated in the mind. The Sarvastavada became uh, a very prominent school in northern India, particularly in the northwest. And when we um, encounter, for example, Tibetan writings that talk about the Hinayana, as they call it, it's the Sarvastavada doctrines that they're referencing. Uh, it seems that t the Tibetans only knew the Sarvastivada or offshoots of the t Sarvastivada. They were also the first school that we know of to put the Buddhist writings into the Sanskrit language. Uh, prior to that time, the uh, Buddhists would... would um, retain their doctrines in what are called prakrits, that is, uh, uh, vernaculars derived from Sanskrit, or uh, like Pali that the Theravada uses, is a derivative of Sanskrit. It could be classed as a prakrit, except that it was probably never an actual vernacular, but it was kind of a simplified Sanskrit. <clears throat> 
it was felt by the Sarvastivadins that uh, writing in Sanskrit gave gave them more of a, um, a kind of a scholarly or authoritative uh, feel to their their uh, doctrines. The Saviravada at at this time, the main group, we should no longer even really use that term. This is another point of confusion here. They at the third council they were called the Vibhajavadins or the school of analysis. And there are different interpretations of what this actually meant or referred to. Uh, but the one that seems to make the most sense is that it was in distinction to the Sarvastivada. The well, Sarvastivada said everything exists. The Vibhajavadin said, no, we discriminate uh, between past, present, and future. So the Vibhajavadins were the holders of the traditional or orthodox doctrine at this point. And there were further splits. The Sautrantikas, another important school that split off from the Sarvastivada, and they were particularly known for denying the, um, the value of the Abhidhamma and holding to the suttas only. And they developed some peculiar doctrines that were tending towards personalism. They held that the five aggregates actually migrate from life to life. Another school, the Vasiputriya, took this even further. And they're sometimes called the Pudgalawadans. Pudgala means the person. And a lot of the controversies in the Katawatu referenced this school and their various divisions because they continued splitting as well. But their principal idea was that there is a person outside the five aggregates. So these various schools were moving away from the central idea of Buddhism, of emptiness or anatta. They were postulating some kind of a real person that transmigrates. The Mula Sarvastivadins, another split off the Sarvastivadins, the Mula means root, they were actually the branch that was probably known by the Tibetans. They were a subgroup of the Sarvastivadins, and it's their Vinaya that survives in Tibetan Buddhism. The Bajavadins, I mentioned already, they were the ancestors of the Theravada, and they took this name at the Third Council uh, to distinguish themselves from the Sarvastivada. The Mahisasakas was an early split off of these. They are very close in their ideas to the Theravada. They only differ from the Theravada in some very minor points of uh, Abhidhamma and definitions of terms and so on. Nothing of, of really great significance, although, although this was also um, characteristic of the period that very small, minute, hair-splitting points could become the reason for splitting off and uh, establishing a separate school. They were also present in um, Sri Lanka early on. So uh, Theravada did not have exclusive domain in Sri Lanka in the beginning. There were some of these other early schools also had a presence there. One of the branches of the Mahasasikas became very important later is the Dharmaguptakas. And they were originally based very far away from the south. They were originally based in Gandhara, which is in Afghanistan now. And uh, they are mostly known for the extensive missionary work that they carried on outside of India. And they proselytized Buddhism into East Asia. 
And so there, they were a major influence in China, in getting Buddhism into China. So their Vinaya, the Dharmaguptaka Vinaya, is that which survives in China and uh, East Asia generally. And the Bakuni lineage, which has now been reestablished, traces its ordinations back through the Dharmaguptaka. So these are some of the major branches of the Staviravada. And the picture is more complicated than this survey would um, indicate. There were many other minor schools, and some schools are hard to classify as whether they belong to the Staviravada or the Mahasamgika. Now, turning to the Mahasamgika, they too continue to split as centuries went by. And as we said, they were originally founded on the point of the five principles of Mahadeva, which downgraded the status of an Arahant and elevated the status of a Buddha. One of their branches was the Lokutaravadans, which means the transcendental school. And they are the branch that uh, was established in the Northwest. And the, for example, the, the famous Buddha statues at Bamiyan in Afghanistan that the Taliban blew up, they were probably built by adherents of the school. They emphasized further the transcendental nature of the Buddha and they were one of the first schools to accept some of the Mahayana sutras. In particular, the early sutra, the Prajnaparamita sutra, which is one, if not the earliest, is one of the earliest Mahayana sutras. And they, uh, they incorporated that into their canon. The Gokulikas was another branch of the Mahasamgikas, and they were the opposite of the Sautrantikas we discussed earlier. The Gokalikas held that only the Abhidhamma was of value, and, and the sutras were only um, a very lower grade sort of teaching fables. They weren't important. And they, they held the, that logic and reasoning was very important in, in the development. And they also did not uh, fully accept the authority of the Vinaya and felt that they could kind of make up their own rules. So we kind of see, that again, here something that is known um, later in the, that many of the Mahayana traditions uh, disregarded parts of, of the Vinaya that were, that were inconvenient. Finally, a very important school in terms of the development of Theravada, because this is the school that the Theravadins in Sri Lanka were probably most in contact with. These were the Andakas, who were probably the same as another school that is referred to as the Chaitakas. This is another problem in that the names, different sources will have different names for the same school. But if they were two separate schools, they were actually very close in their uh, ideas. And they also had some uh, proto-Mahayana tendencies. For example, the emphasis on the Bodhisattva Yana, the Bodhisattva path, which is characteristic of the Mahayana. This became... Um, introduced uh, amongst the Andakas. They also had a teaching about something they called the Mula Vinyana, the root consciousness, which seems to have been the origin of the doctrine in Yogacara, which was a fully Mahayana school, of the Alaya Vinyana, that is the storehouse consciousness. 
This is a characteristic, uh, important doctrine of the um, Yogacara, that there is a, a kind of a, a layer of consciousness in which the seeds of Kama are stored. The criticism of this is that it tends towards the idea of a, some kind of immortal or abiding essence in a being, which is contrary to the the idea of anatta or emptiness, they would deny this. They have ways of interpreting it. But from outside, it's um, it's the way it seems. So these are the major schools. And as I said, there are many more. There are some uh, rather colorful accounts that have come down to us about how some of these schools arose. There's one school that's called Bahasrutriya, and according to their own account that has come down to us, it was founded by an Arahant bhikkhu who during the lifetime of the Buddha traveled north into the Himalayas to practice meditation and went into jhana for 200 years. And then at the end of 200 years, when he emerged from jhana and returned to the populated areas in, in India, and he encountered monks and spoke with them, he was a shocked to discover that many of the um, more transcendental teachings of the Buddha had been forgotten. And so he restored the original teachings of the Buddha. And this is the claim of this school. So we have a very complex picture and the details are always not clear. But what I think is important in this picture for an understanding of later developments is that there were three Vinaya traditions that survived. One was the Theravada, which survived via Sri Lanka. And we'll see that in a subsequent talk, how that uh, the importance of Sri Lanka in this history, that Sri Lanka was really, um, and actually one monastery in Sri Lanka, the Mahavihara, was the source of all modern day Theravadins. The Mula Sarvastavada, which was a branch of the Sarvastavadas that was prominent in the Northwest, like in Kashmir, and found their way eventually into Tibet, or their Vinaya at least, found its way into Tibet and still survives to this day. And the Dharmaguptaka, which uh, sent missionaries into China and established a tradition in China that uh, although the, uh, the monks over time switched to Mahayana, began reading and incorporating Mahayana uh, sutras and doctrines, they retained the original Vinaya. So the Dharmaguptaka Vinaya remains in, in place in, in East Asia. And it's that ordination lineage through Dharmaguptaka that is behind the modern uh, Bhikkhuni lineage because the Bhikkhuni lineage died out in Theravada and in Mulasavastavada. It's only the Dharmaguptaka lineage. The other important point here is to bear in mind the fundamental divisions in all this kind of proliferation of schools, the most important divisions historically was first of all the split between the Staviravada and the Mahasamgikas, because the Staviravadas eventually became the Theravadas, and the Mahasamgikas eventually became the Mahayana. But the uh, Staviravada also had an important split early on between the Vibhajavadins and the Sarvastavadins. And the Vibhajavadins are the ones who eventually found their way into Sri Lanka and 
became the Theravadins. And they were considered the Orthodox tradition at the time of the Third Council, and the Sarvastivadins were the, um, although they were, again, this is another echo of the Second Council and the Council of Petalaputra, because the Sarvastivadins were probably at that time in the majority. They were a very uh, prevalent school, but the influence of King Asoka may have, may have tipped the scales. And the Vibhajavadins were recognized as the orthodox tradition. And all these schools were operating in India from the time of the Second Council when the proliferations began and they increased after the Third Council under Asoka all the way down to the time of Buddha in the, roughly the... Um, 5th century AD. So we're now more than a thousand years from the time of the Buddha. And at that time, there was already not only a proliferation of these schools, but there also had arisen this entirely new Mahayana. One of the historical problems that's not resolved, and there's a lot that's not resolved in this period, that the uh, sources are contradictory and uh, inadequate. But one of the mysteries is really where and when and how the Mahayana came in to the picture. Because we have, for example, texts from Buddhaghosa's time where in his, uh, in Buddhaghosa's commentaries and in other contemporaries, there was considerable criticism of the various other schools and even of, of some philosophical traditions outside of Buddhism like Sankhya and Vedanta, but there doesn't seem to be any direct, clear mention of Mahayana as a separate tradition. Now one theory is that the Mahayana at this time was known to have existed probably from the first century BC, was probably limited to one small area in south central India that was something of a backwater. It was off the main trade routes and so it was little known. And the uh, monks who lived there were not in much contact with the broader currents in India. So they were sort of free to indulge in wild speculation and go, you know, completely off the reservation. Of course, we know Mahayana later became very powerful and influential in India and elsewhere. And this whole um, history of these, these schools, as obscure as it is, it does illustrate the uh, first of all, the very human tendency of religions to split and divide. We know that all religions follow this kind of pattern that they'll uh, divide on points of doctrine and then get further and further apart. But it also illustrates a peculiarly Indian, I think, habit of mind of the love of philosophic speculation that characterized Indian civilization and uh, the love of debate and um, learned disputes on very minor points. If we read some of these accounts of the different doctrines of the different schools, although there are some really major divergences like the nature of a Buddha, the nature of an Arahant, and whether a person exists or not, most of the controversies were actually over very minute, obscure, hair-splitting points of interpretation of, of Abhidhamma. And it's very difficult for a modern person even to 
enter into that mindset and appreciate the importance they put on these tiny points. It seems that the Abhidhamma, as a, as a separate um, pitaka, was a later development than the, the suttas. We, we have seen that the Abhidhamma was not spoken at the first council, but it was spoken at the third council under Asoka, and the Katawatu was added at that time. And what we have, we have the, um, the Abhidhamma of the Sarvastavadas, and we have some partial Abhidhammas from some of the other schools preserved in Chinese or Tibetan translation. And what we find is a much greater divergence the Sutta Pitakas that survive in different recensions, like the um, Chinese Agamas, which are probably the Dharmaguptaka texts translated into Chinese, and some of the Sanskrit texts that have been found, there is quite a, a large degree of agreement that everyone seemed to have the same Sutta Pitaka but the Abhidhamma is all over the place, quite different. Um, Abhidharmas is the Sanskrit, which most of them use. The Abhidharmas were quite different from one school to another. And it seems that they were probably developed, in a sense, as manifestos of the different schools, as a way of stating their position. Like, this is how we interpret things, taken to a, a very minute level. Here we understand this and that, that these factors are associated with, with these factors. This is the cause of this. This is the cause of that. And everything taken down to a very fine point of analysis. And the differences between the different schools were expressed primarily in their Abhidharmas. So that is a survey of the various schools of Buddhism. And what I propose to do for the next talk will be to look at the reign of Ahsoka and um, the Third Council. So I'll take my leave.